at this uh, Security and Defense Conference. You know that security and defense is an important part of the task of the High Representative. Uh, people believe it is about uh, foreign policy. Uh, it's foreign and security policy. And the defense policy is part of the security policy. So more and more, the role of the High Representative will be related with security and defense. I'm saying that because in one month, another high rep will be here talking with you, and I'm sure that uh, she will understand perfectly that security and defense is an integral part of the job of the high representative. I tried to do it uh, since the beginning, when Europe was still sleeping, was still believing that uh, war was far away, it was not something that uh, matters. At the beginning of 2021, things were completely different. We presented the strategic compass, which was a, a kind of a white paper, white paper on defense. Now another white paper will be published in, in some weeks by the new commission together with the new high rep. But the strategic compass was already a kind of a white paper for the European defense. And the main message of this document, which is already an old document, was that uh, Europe was in danger. And many people believe that this was a kind of a market slogans, something that you say in order to make people listening to you. It was a kind of a overreaction. No, it was not an overreaction. I think it was not a high intensity reaction as it needed. Because since then, the Russian aggression against Ukraine has continued and the security environment of Europe has dramatically changed. Maybe the citizens are not um, so much aware of that, but we should be aware of that, that the security environment has dramatically changed. And one year ago, the war returned to the Middle East. And now the war is closer. And if uh, by accident or by will it was going to be a full war between Israel and Iran, then the consequences will still be stronger for all of us. If the war that started with the terrorist attack of Hamas followed by the IDF attack, Israeli forces against Gaza, and then Lebanon, and now uh, retaliations, one side and the other, between Iran and Israel, could reach a certain level involving nuclear facilities, involving oil production facilities, maybe producing troops in the ground in the war in Lebanon, then the security situation of Europe will be really, really dangerous. But without that, look at our environment, from Ukraine to the Caucasus, to the Middle East, to Sudan, to Sahel, we are surrounded by an arc of fire from Gibraltar to the Baltic not to talk about the tension in the South China Sea, which is not exactly our immediate environment, but the Red Sea is closer to us and is being attacked by the Houthis. Some weeks ago, I was on board of a couple of uh, warships of the European Navy, member states in the Red Sea, uh, and certainly, mm, this is not very, very easy, and it could be much, much worse, depending on the um, events 
on the Middle East. Russia is again targeting Ukrainian grain. The issue of exports of grain from the Black Sea is again a problem. Last week, they bombed Odessa and they attacked three foreign flag ships. So uh, the war in Ukraine will continue presenting difficulties to everybody in the world due to energy and food related questions. And there is also the question of the long-term involvement of the United States in European security. In uh, two or three weeks, by the middle of November, this uh, question mark will be solved. But be sure that the long-term involvement of the United States in European security is becoming more and more uncertain. And all these developments have catapulted the security and defense to the top of the political agenda of Europe. The war in Ukraine was a wake-up call, but uh, you can be waking up and not getting out of the bed. One thing is to be wake up, and another thing is to stand up. You can be wake up and say, okay, I turn to the other side, I continue sleeping. <laughs> and maybe what's happening to us is that the war was a wake up, but not everybody has been standing up. Not everybody has continuing doing things after waking up. And we have to do it. We have to take full conscience of the great deal that uh, the Russia aggression represents for us. Yes, we have done things. Yes, certainly. We delivered weapons to a country at war for the first time in our history. I am quite proud of having had a decisive role in making it happen and convincing my colleagues that the European Peace Facility that was not thought, was not created for that, could be used for that. And we have been using it, and by the time being, it's about 42 billion euros that has been channeled to the Ukrainian defense capacity. 42 billion of military support. Just of military support, 42, and it is increasing. We'll reach 45 quickly, before the end of the year. It's not as much as the U.S., but certainly is not a negligible figure. And if we add up everything, military, humanitarian, economic, financial, then we are at about 110 billion euros of support to Ukraine. And this is certainly more than what the U.S. have been providing. Well, this is a, certainly a game changer. The story of our military support to Ukraine will be part of the story of the development of the defense capacities of Europe. Remind that we, at the beginning we were providing helmets. Our first move was let's send them some helmets. Now we are sending them F-16. Between helmets and F-16, a long way. But on each step of this long way, it has been a too long hesitancy. We have been doubting and discussing too much. Do we have to provide Leopard tanks? Oh, no, no, no. No, the Russians will be very upset. Better not. Long discussion. <clears throat> at, the, at the end, we provided Leopard tanks. Do we have to provide Patriots? Oh, no, no, Patriots, certainly not. The Russians will be very upset. At the end, we provided Patriots. Do we have to provide jet set? Fight in jets? Oh, no, fight the jets. My God. Certainly, it will be an escalation. The Russians will be really upset. At the end, we provided F-16. But every time it took too long, every time that we increase the quality of our support, we spend months discussing, 
by doing what was decided or proposed at the beginning. And this is something in which I feel guilty. We should have done the same thing quicker. And this delay has been measured in terms of lives. If we had been more assertive from the beginning, providing Ukraine with the arms that we fi finally provided them, maybe the war would be different. And now there is another pending question. Do we have to allow Ukraine with the capacity of hitting inside Russian territory? The answer by the time being is no. But uh, let's see. Ukraine is asking uh, and considering that this is a key question in order to win this war. I think that we did a lot, but maybe too slowly. And for the future, this lesson has to be learned. If you want to support someone who is facing a war, put from the beginning all the capacity they need and you are ready to provide. Now in Ukraine, Russia is destroying the energy system. This is the purpose, to put Ukraine in the dark and in the cold. And they are being quite successful on that. 70% of the electricity capacity in Ukraine has been destroyed. Ukraines could face up to 20 hours without electricity in winter. And it's quite cool in Ukraine in winter. So the important thing for us today is to continue providing Ukraine with electricity generators, but avoid that the generator that we are providing today is not going to be destroyed tomorrow. We have to go out of the circle as we provide, they destroy, we re-provide. We have to provide more air defense capacity, getting out of the vicious circle of uh, we repair, they destroy. By the time being, they have a strong capacity to destroy. 70% of the electricity capacity generated in Ukraine has been destroyed. And this country will not be able to resist without electricity. And in order for them to have electricity, we have to provide with more air defense capacity. Air defense systems are the red lines for the Ukrainians to continue defending. Certainly ammunition. Ammunition is the bread and butter of a warfare when the warfare becomes a war of attrition. I want to remind Commissioner Thierry Breton, who did a remarkable job in increasing European ammunition production capacity. The issue was to provide one million of uh, 155 caliber ammunition. Uh, Thierry did a great job on increasing the capacity of ammunition production. In one year, we have doubled the ammunition output of the European industry. We are still not there, but to multiply by two, to double the capacity of production of ammunition in Europe in less than one year, I think is a, is a success that has to be remarked. Now we have to go to other areas in our defense industry. And since there are many representatives of the defense industry in this room, I suppose that uh, your question is, where are the orders? Because many of you, when I am talking with you, they tell me, stop talking and presenting orders. If you propose me to produce and you are ready to pay, don't worry, I will produce. The capacity will be created if the demand is there. If a sustainable demand is being presented by the governments, the industry will increase its capacity, but not to produce for just one year, because then the investment will not be profitable. But if you ask us to produce with a sustained demand, the industry will respond. The governments are the only buyers for the defense products. 
if they are the only buyers, it is to them to fix the priorities. To fix the priorities, what has to be produced, and to provide funding. And each member state has a relatively small domestic market. We are too much fragmented. Draghi says that in his report. It's not a secret. We are fragmented because we are politically fragmented. We are not a state. We don't have a Pentagon. We are 27 states, 27 armies, 27 ecosystems of industrial capacity. Each one too small. Only 18% of the military procurements are made in a cooperative manner. We said years ago that the target was 30%. We are not there, we are just on 18%. Now we said in the, in the last um, proposals that we made in the Commission and the European Defense Agency, the target will be 35%. In Europe, we are very good at fixing targets. And when we approach the deadline and we haven't reached a target, we announce a higher target without asking ourselves why we didn't get the target before. Instead of saying why we, don't, we are not on the 30%, we say, well, don't worry, we'll be in the 35%. But which are the reasons why we are not reached the target that we proposed some years before? This is the real question. And Mario Draghi tells it the vicious circle of the European Union defense industry, which is this vicious circle. Without demand aggregation among member states, the industry cannot benefit from economies of scale, so it innovate, innovate and invest too, too little in order to cover the long-term needs. Fragmentation, reduction of economies of scale, not enough innovation, not enough investment. The Europeans altogether, we invest on military innovation, research and development, 10 times less than the US, exactly 10 times less. They invest 100, we invest 10. Certainly, we cannot cope with our competitors. Yes, we have seen 30% increase in investment in defense equipment, reaching 67 billion last year, 30% more. So the demand is increasing, 30% more of demand. Not military expenditure, demand for military capacities, because military expenditure, you know, military expenditure is a lot of different things. The retirement of the uh, servicemen which go to pensions, they are part of military expenditure. If I increase the pensions of the military, they will increase the military expenditure, but not will increase the military capacity. So let's talk about things that matters. Things that matters is the capabilities, and capabilities comes from investment. And investment has increased 30% in the last years. We are in 67 billions, but, but, but 80% of this defense investment has, be, has been done outside the European Union. We invested 30% more, but 80% of this 30% was a demand addressed to someone who was producing out of the European Union. This is the quick question. How do we manage to increase our investment in defense and we make this demand being addressed to our ecosystem? This vicious circle has to be broken. And for that, we have to do several things at the same time. Provide military support to Ukraine at the right level. That's not the case today. That's not the case today. Replenish the stocks of our armies 
increase our own defense capabilities, reduce our excessive dependencies, this 80% is a clear excessive dependency, and innovate to prepare the defense capabilities of tomorrow, not to produce the arms that were conceived years ago, but to start conceiving the arms that will have to be produced tomorrow, because the war of tomorrow will be done with the arms of tomorrow, not with the arms of yesterday. And for to achieve that, we need to better coordinate the demand side and the supply side of the market. And we need to be clear on who does what. Who does what? And until the treaties will be reformed, if they are one day, a huge challenge in the coming years will be to break the booths without breaking the law. To break the booths inside the perimeter of the existing treaties. Not to try to be out of the treaties in order to break a taboo, because this is something that will not work. We have to do what has to be done inside the treaties, as we did with the fight against COVID. We were inside the treaties, and we found inside the treaties the way of going to the markets and asked for 700 billions of funding in order to fight against the virus. And we did that because it was clear that the virus was an existential threat. No doubt about it. People were dying. Then it was clear the instant threat. The hospitals were full. Even the trucks of the army were required to take the bodies. People were dying. So it was an existential threat. Clearly, it was. No doubt. And then we reacted accordingly with the fact that it was an existential threat. If the Russian aggression against Ukraine was also an existential threat to our security, and being perceived like this, as the virus was, then the reaction would be the same, taking the adequate measures in order to face this existential threat. But it's not the case. It is not being perceived as an existential threat as the virus was. And that's why be prepared for a long discussion about how to fund the capacities, the development of the military capacities of the European Union. And be prepared to have an intense discussion about the line between defense industry and defense policy. Defense industry is something that belongs to the member states and where the Commission has a role because it has the duty, according with the treaties, of supporting the industry also the defense industry. But defense policy or defense, it's something that belongs to the member states. For example, the proposed European Air Shield, is that an industrial project or it is a defense project? Who has to conceive it? The armies. Who has to manage it? The militaries. <laughs> I don't imagine the bureaucrats in Berlin on managing an inner defense shield. It has to be conceived by the army, by the ones who know about it, and the ones who are able to manage, to control, and command, because this is a defense capacity. Only the armies can do that, so only the member states can do that. Certainly, it will be also a spillover over the defense industry, because part of this shield will be constituted by things that could be produced in Europe. But who is in the lead? The defense project or the defense policy? The instrument or the capacity? This is something in which, on the next financial perspective, a lot of political discussions will take place. But I believe that the governments are the only ones that can define the specification of an earth shield and its command structure and how it will be integrated into existing defense structures. Nobody can substitute them. And that's why it's natural, the natural way for such a project would be to use the PESCO. The PESCO should be the natural way of developing this kind of uh, project that later, later, but only later, 
will have to be funded, and the industry will have their part, their role on producing the elements to make it a reality. I ask to everybody not to invent the wheel every day. We should not create new structures, forgetting what we already have. We already have the European Defense Agency. Its role has to be expanded to develop more and better military research projects, to better aggregate the demand and coordinate joint procurements as the treaty tasks the agency to do. Then the funding. Draghi says 500 billion for the next decade. 500 billion for a decade means 50 billion per year. It's quite an amount of money, maybe not too much according with our needs. Where this money will come from? Can we wait for the next multi-year financial framework, 2028? Can we wait four years for that? I don't think so. If we cannot wait for the next financial perspective, then we should anticipate resources by issuing European debt as we did in 2020 in response to the COVID. But to issue debt, for what? I am anticipating the discussion among the members of the European Union Council. To issue debt, for what? What are we going to finance with debt? First thing, it could be to finance a major military effort in support of Ukraine, and to force Putin to go to the negotiation table. This would be perfectly a good reason. And I think the treaty could allow with the legal provisions for doing that. We could and we should to go to the financial markets and ask for money in order to increase our military effort in support of Ukraine. It is the only way of making Putin going to the negotiation table. Putin will not go to the negotiation table unless it will be forced for it. And it will not be forced for it unless Ukraine has advantage on the military field. And it will not have it without a stronger support from our side. And we will not be able to provide this support without more funding. And the only way the more funding can come is from a debt issue. If the Russian aggressive imperialism was truly seen as an existential threat to the Union, which I believe it is, then the choice would be done very quickly. It's just a matter of political perception by the public opinions, political parties, and governments. The second purpose would be to boost our defense readiness to better finance the capabilities of our armies by procuring military equipment. This is a different purpose. This is a different purpose. And it raises a question of moral hazard. It's going to be fair to issue common debt to equip the armies of member states that have so far done no efforts or little effort to develop their defense capabilities? Why should the European Union to pay for the lazards? Some member states today, they spend 4% of their GMP on military capacities, 4%. Others, 1.8%. Why should the ones who have been paying for their military capabilities now to pay for the increase in military capacities of the others who hasn't done in the past. This is exactly the same moral hazard that we face with the Euro crisis. And this question will be put certainly on the table when member states will discuss about it. And one thing is also clear, so member states will agree on that as far as the expenditure to produce is happening inside the European Union. 
not to spend outside the European Union. And this requires a strong increase on the defense capacity of the Union. Because in order to produce more, you have to have more production capacity. Side uh, of demand, side of supply. In a market, both matters. Both matters. You can have finance to finance demand. <laughs> it is no supply capacity. Then the demand goes out of the circuit and asking for another provider, be it in South Korea or in the U.S. So the third purpose of a debt could be just to increase the capacity of the industrial defense and technological sector, to, to, to give subsidies to increase capacity. But to increase capacity to produce what? We have to be sure that those industrial capabilities will be matched by long-term needs of our armies. And this is something that uh, has to be done carefully because if you don't do this matching adequately, we can waste a lot of money. And the Draghi report injected much needed straight talk into European debate, debate on defense. I don't agree with uh, all the proposals of Draghi, but at least it has put on the table the need of trying to work in order to match the defense in the defense uh, dimension of the European politics, supply and demand. And the European Defense Agency has been doing a lot of work in order to define the demand side, what our armies need in order to avoid fragmentation and use the money in a more efficient manner. So my successor and the leaders of the European Union will have uh, to have a lot of work in order to clarify who does what. The Commission has to do a lot of things according with their competences. And their competences are limited to the industrial side of the question. But defense policy, from doctrine to capabilities to deployment, is something that belongs and will continue belonging to the member states. So a strong cooperation between institutions will be needed in order to take the right decisions and to take them quickly. I don't think Europe can wait for the next financial cycle and to discuss the new financial perspective four years from now to start doing what has to be done now because it should have been done in the past. It was not done in the past. Don't wait for tomorrow. Do it now. The security of Ukraine is our security. And supporting Ukraine is supporting ourselves. And providing Ukraine, Ukraine with the military capability they need now because they are at war would be a better and less expensive way of ensuring our own security. Thank you.